Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we're on. <laughs> um, let me speak real quick. It's Sunday, and I just had no uh, plan on speaking. <laughs> and I just posted uh, the Sunday sermon, which is you, some of you, most of you saw that already. Uh, Sunday, uh, the end of March, you know, whatever date it is, I'll put it on the video. Is it today? March 20th. Uh, I didn't plan on speaking, and I did not get a chance to study. But this last week, as I've been reading through the book of Job in the last few weeks, as well as, you know, my regular reading, there's a lot of great wisdom in the book of Job. And if I were just to pick one, you know, it there was one chapter where Job is contemplating the end of life, his plight that he is in at the time, his great struggling. And he looks at all of the trees and all of the growth and, and flowers and everything. And it's interesting because he says, when a tree dies, now I do not remember the chapter, but he says, when a tree dies and the flower goes away, he says, yet out of the stump, or the root that is still in the earth, it will come back again. And it's interesting because behind me, uh, when I had the freeze in Texas, and a lot of my fruit trees, we, we do have citrus trees, like you would have in the southern climates, Florida and so forth. But where I live in Corpus Christi, it's really not the best. If you go to a place that's called the valley, which is, you know, 100 miles south of where I'm standing. That's where you have uh, a lot of, you know, citrus and things because it's just a little bit warmer. But still, if you get a freeze, whether Florida or anywhere, they will kill citrus trees. So we are blessed here where I live to plant those types of trees, to have fruit trees. Most of you know, like in the northern parts of the country, you can't have them because of climate. But you have different types. So anyway, uh, behind me is one of the lemon trees that I built was totally gone. And eventually, because I cut it down completely, I planted sprouts of those trees in different spots. But sure enough, it came back out of the roots. And that lemon tree there, I burnt the stump out because I, it was completely frozen, that tree dead. I cut the limbs. So when Job said one of his... Uh, statements was when a tree goes even if you think it's totally gone it comes back again and I like that insight but this is what he says and like I said I didn't study in the sense that I just read it that one passing fleeting moment he says but look at man he says when man dies He's gone for good. Now, we understand, like the book of Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, that Job at this moment is speaking out of a point of total, you know, like, tribulation, depression, cut off that sense of being uh, alienated. But the statement he makes is prophetic, though, because he says, when man dies, He's gone for good. He's not like that stump of the tree that comes back. It's, stop! Stop! <laughs> He's not like the stump of the tree that comes back. But he goes away. Look, I feed my cats up here. Get! And the seagulls, I feed the seagulls when I feed the cats. But I knew that there was a verse from Job himself where he says, I know my Redeemer liveth, and at the end of the days, in my flesh, I will stand before God. I will be raised. Now, I knew that that scripture was going to come up later in the book of Job. And it's, I believe, Job 19, which I am not at yet. But the statement that he said, when man dies, he doesn't come back until the heavens and the earth pass away. That's prophetic because 
it reminds me of the scripture that I believe sometimes we misinterpret, which is from Jesus. And Jesus says, not one jot or tittle from the law will pass away. Even until the heavens and the earth, as long as they remain, the law remains until all is fulfilled. Okay, so now Jesus makes a statement that all of the law stays in place, if you will, until it's all fulfilled. Until heaven and earth pass away, there's going to be no change. And now you got to pay attention here, though it was not a study that I did. It's the same sense I had from the words of Job. Because Job was correct when he said, <laughs> man stays in the ground. As long as the heavens and the earth remain, his body's in that grave. But there's coming a day where there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And the former things are passed away and new things do I declare. So even though at that moment, the statement was true, that man stays in that grave. He is not like the tree. He says, the stump will come back, but man is not that way. He says, as long as the heavens remain, he stays in. But you understand, there's a day when there's going to be a new heavens and a new world, Isaiah the prophet says. And so like that scripture in the gospel, when Jesus says, verily I say unto you, not one jot or tittle of the law, not one point of law is going to pass away until all is fulfilled. And it's very important to understand that Jesus actually says he fulfilled all the law. And so in the understanding of the great Christian theologians and scholars and teachers, that scripture is difficult at times because they say Paul's writings in Galatians and Romans are very clear that the believer, if you will, is not under the law. And I can give you so many scriptures about that. But whenever Paul says or teaches that, that we are not under the law, he always gives the statement, does this mean that we go out and have, if you will, freedom to sin, to kill, to do all those things? And he says, no, God forbid. If I bring back again the things that I destroyed, I'm now a transgressor. Meaning in Christ, the law is fulfilled. We are free in grace. But we are free in grace to walk in that fullness of God. The fulfillment, the, the singular commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the difficulty from the passage of Jesus, which some you know, well-meaning Christian Jews, they will say, Jesus said, none of the law will pass away. But he said, until it's all fulfilled, which it was fulfilled, in him. In him. If we are not under the law, we are under grace. And we're, I could teach it all again, Romans and Galatians, but the principle is, it was fulfilled. The principle of the resurrection that at that desperation point Job could not understand was, yes, Job, you're right. Man is staying in that ground as long as the heavens and the earth remain. But there's coming a new day. And it's interesting because as we understand Scripture and these little things I'm sharing with you, oftentimes the prophets or the writers of the Scripture themselves did not have the full import of the things that they were writing or saying. And so this is why as we as the Christian church, as believers, we talk about the inspiration of scripture because it's, we say all scripture is given, Timothy a verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for instruction, reproof. And so there's an element there is a reformer by the name of John Calvin in church history. And you know that I can give you Catholic scholars or Protestant scholars, uh, his, men like Mr. Calvin in the Reformation of the 1500s, 
there were three main figures, John Calvin and Martin Luther, the most prominent, most famous out of Germany, and then uh, Earl Wicks Wingley. So these are three very influential people in the 1500s that had this, you know, launching ultimately the Protestant movement. But it's interesting, I used to have the book by Calvin called The Institutes of Christian Religion, and it's one of the many books I gave away. <laughs> but either way, John Calvin, I, I bring him up because as these scholars, as well as up to the present day, talked about the inspiration of the Word of God and the Christian view that, of course, I hold to. But Calvin had a unique perspective on how do we know the Word of God is the Word of God. And he said that you also know it by that sense of the Spirit of God speaking to the believer. And that was unique in, as far as I can recall, that that viewpoint of Mr. Calvin was, we also understand that the Word of God is the Word of God because God is communicating to His people through His Word. And I, I liked that. Uh, a few, last week I got to listen to an online service from the different uh, churches I know and used to go to. And so I'll try to catch different ones. And it was good, but it was uh, the main pastor who's a friend of mine it was out of the country, should be back this Sunday. I, in the past, went with him to Switzerland many years ago. So he was the Sunday when I, last Sunday when I was watching him, uh, they said, uh, Pastor Don is in somewhere in Africa, Tonga or something. But I liked it because we have a lot of African friends. <laughs> and the message was good. And I thought it was interesting because I'm not sure if Pastor Don, maybe he, maybe he would have been a little <laughs> not as like, oh, but it was a good message. It was a black brother. And, uh, but he was sharing, I'm sure he's educated. And so he was talking about the differences in the Gospels. And particularly John's Gospel is very unique to what we refer to as the other three, which are the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so in John's Gospel, as Christians over the centuries <laughs> began collecting the Word of God and, you know, publications in the 1400, you had the printing press at Gutenberg, which happened to come out right at the time of the great printing of many, many versions of Bibles that uh, was a result of the Reformation, which I already referenced. So this did, this good brother, as he was preaching, I didn't get to hear the whole message because one of my homeless friends came by. So I spent some time with him. But he said, the reason why uh, some of the accounts are differing in the Gospels is sort of like if you pass a message along to one person and then by the time it gets to the other side of the room the message might be totally different. Now I have heard critics of scripture use that example whether it's a barterman or whoever and when they use it in a way it's being used actually maybe in a way that denies the inspiration of scripture. But I know this good brother who was using it, he's educated and he must have learned that. And so what he kind of gave was the reason the Gospels might be a little different was because the word, he was, he was historically accurate. He said in the beginning of the movement of Christ, everything was passed along through oral, oral tradition. And then the compil compilation of the Gospels came along a few years later. And liberal scholars say, oh, much, much later. But the Gospels were not written immediately at the time of when Christ was walking. So you have, you know, a period of so many years, 10, 15 years, that they finally be compiled. And that's, a, I'm giving you the early date. Others say, oh, it was much later. And so some say, and it was in that period of time where the oral tradition, the message that was going forth from the believer, that, you know, that's why there might be some differences. Now, there's ways we can explain the differences. 
and I've done that before and it's not my intent to go through it all right now, but there are differing accounts, particularly in John's Gospel, from some of the same events in the other Gospels. But it's not real big, and it's things that, you know, we could explain. But to some uh, Christians, in, in the earlier days of Christianity, when we had the collection of Scripture and the collection of books, it wasn't, uh, there was an early writing of a parallel gospels. I forget offhand who had done this, but it was a writing where Christians could read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all together as a parallel account. And it was at those times where Christians began noticing, oh, there's some differences in the accounts. And you can, you know, various ways we explain the differences in the accounts. What I like to tell people is this, the Old Testament, we're talking a little bit about the law and the fulfillment of law in Christ, but the Old Testament and the collection of the books of the Old Testament, and then in the history, I didn't study recently, but in the history of the collecting of the Old Testament books, the Jewish people under the reign of the time of Alexander the Great and in the rise of the Greek uh, Empire, you had a collection of the books that were put together from the Old Testament, which was Hebrew, and they came into a Greek translation, and it was called the Septuagint. So the Septuagint was a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And this came about, this history is not covered in the Protestant Bible. But this, some of this history is covered in the Catholic Bible, which we refer to in the books that are called the Apocrypha, the Apocryphal books. And that's that period of time in the Protestant Bible, the Old Testament ends with the prophet Malachi. And of course, the New Testament begins with Matthew. But in the Catholic Bible, you have an insertion of the books that are called the Apocrypha. Now, I don't want to debate the Apocrypha, but I want to say the history of this period of time between Malachi and Matthew, some of it is indeed covered in the apocryphal books. But you have that period where the scholars got together and translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. The story, for those who are interested in being a have it on, is 70 scholars. It, it varies. It's either 70, some I think say 72, but it's, it's where the term actually I think Septuagint comes from. But the story is the 70 scholars all separately went into their own rooms, took the Hebrew Old Testament, translated it, and they did it individually. And then when they all came out, all of their transla translations were exact. Now, that's the story. You know, we put some history stories in the category of they're interesting. <laughs> but either way, that's where, that's how the story go. So they felt it was inspired. That's because they all translated it individually. And the Greek translation was, you know, the same. Okay, that's the Old Testament Greek version, which was really prominent in the days of Christ. When they were familiar with the Old Testament, Jesus himself will quote sometimes, and there are other quotes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek, quoting into the New Testament, which is also, by the way, in Greek, because the influence of Alexander the Great, which I already mentioned. Now, to the deep thinkers, sometimes there's difficulty with that, because when the scripture would eventually be translated and come into, you know, the New Testament time, you also would have a process of the Christian church collecting which books are going to be in the canonical, the rule, the canon, the accepted ones. And there was a process of that, and it goes to, up to the council in the fourth century, where it's finally definitively stated these are the books of the New Testament. 
which we as a Christian church recognize. But it's interesting because the idea of the letter of the law, which you both see in the writings of the Apostle Paul, where he says to the Corinthians, you are the living letters. You are these living epistles. The idea of the church itself, the people of God in the community, as this testimony of God. I've taught many times, I have more than one a message called the Logos, which is the term of in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 1. And so Jesus comes as this incarnation of the word of God, that he comes to fulfill everything that was written in the law and the prophets concerning him. And so it's actualized, lived out, fulfilled, the word made flesh and dwelt among us. And we behold his glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father. So now, the sense of the New Testament and the appearing of Christ and the wonderful work of redemption was not dependent upon every jot and tittle. Okay? The law and the Old Testament and then eventually a legalistic mindset and problem that Paul deals with in Romans and Galatians was a almost an obsession with the exact dot and tittle of the law. We have what's called the scribes, which when the earlier translations of scripture were made, and you didn't have what we have in our day, but <laughs> you'd have each one writing down by hand. Even the translation I mentioned called the Septuagint writing down by hand every line, every letter. I have to do physical writing at times with all my catalogs that I do for posts and videos. There, but when I can copy a lot, right off of the flash drive, a particular way I copy, make sheets of copies, I, I have the dates exactly right because I copied them. But it is still necessary for me to put a name, a title, and a date by hand on the next this video today I'll be making I got to do it that way but I'll notice at times I might get it wrong if it's copied right off the flash drive right from the computer making catalog it's more precise so the scribes were very meticulous at this Bible Old Testament when they were you know translating these things and if they found a mistake on one of the pages as they were meticulously writing copies, and also many of the copies in the New Testament in the first century, that's how they were doing it, on different types of things, papyrus and stuff. But if they found a mistake in one of the pages or whatever, as you're going along, they'd have to throw out the whole thing and start over. Best of my recollection, that's how they did it. Because they said, oh, we got off here, we might be off somewhere else. And at times when I'm making catalogs, and I had so many thousand, two thousand, whatever videos. And I noticed at times I got the number 350 wrong. And then every one after that is numbered wrong. So I didn't catch it in time. But now, the breaking into the kingdom, our dependence on God, let we are the living epistles, was going to be and is indeed a different community. It's this community of God that is not, if you will, hung up on the letter of the law. That if you can find some type of perceived mistake, which critics look for, if we can find something differing in the Gospel of John, which indeed some of the accounts are different, some of the critics say, therefore, it's all fake. It's all phony. And I usually and will respond now and say, we have this living testimony of the historical reality of Christ. None of that is fake. The living, the witnesses that witnessed to the resurrection and their testimonies, not only in scripture, but in the historical documents of the first century. You have the original, I can do a whole apologetic on it, but you have this reality of the appearance of Christ the testimony of his resurrection and ascension, not just in scripture, 
but in other documents. And what this shows to us as Christian churches, we are believing God's word and we hold to his word. But we are not like the scribes who said, we are so obsessed with every line, jot, and tittle that if there is a mistake, if you will, then none of it is true. That's what the critics do. That's why I found it a little interesting when that brother I referenced already kind of said, the way we account for the differences in the Gospels is one person shared something to somebody else, and by the time it got to the other, there's some understanding of that. But what I like to see is this. God wants our faith as the church to not be. It's in God. It's in what he has done. We have faith in the word of God. But the book itself is proclaiming the living Christ. Okay? The testimony of scripture itself, it's the spirit of prophecy. It's God revealing himself to us. And when we read the word of God, it's God's word. It's God's communication to us, like Calvin has said. Now, putting it all together, because uh, there's no point on me speaking, that insight from Job, when he was observing the trees, he said something true. But when he said that true thing, he didn't know how true it was. He said, the trees... The plants and the flowers. He said, when they die, when my lemon tree froze, he said, sure enough, out of the root of that ground, they come back again. But then he said, look at the plight of man, and Job was in it himself. He said, my observation is, when man dies, he said, he, that's it. As long as the heavens and the earth remain, my observation, Job said, is he does not come back like those trees. And I would submit to Mr. Job, you're right, Job, until the heavens and the earth pass. You're right. And when Jesus said, not one jot or tittle of this law is going to pass, as long as heaven and earth remains, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass until all is fulfilled. And Jesus from the cross it is finished. It is done. It is fulfilled. And the New Testament community, when we rightfully say we are not under law, we're under grace, it means we're in this new covenant now. And the well-meaning scholars in all types of fields tried to distinguish and say, well, the ceremonial law passed, but it's not speaking about what we understand as the old covenant law and moral law and so forth. They do that well-meaning way to say, you know, we don't sin. Or it's not a license to sin. But I would just say that distinction between ceremonial and moral in Romans and Galatians, that distinction is not made. Paul will say it's all passed away. And then the caveat of because we're under grace, it's not a license to sin. So it's not a big thing. I won't make a big distinction there. But I would simply say I find it interesting that even people like Job or Solomon when he wrote Ecclesiastes, also in a state of depression and all, their observations were correct. Though they could not see the end of the tunnel. Like, uh, if, I don't want to do politics, but a famous presidential candidate when he lost, it was John McCain years ago, who's passed away now. And he was kind of funny, John McCain. I don't want to do politics. But he said, when he lost, he said, uh, like Mao Zedong said, it gets darkest before it gets pitch black. <laughs> yeah, he was kidding around. He had a sense of humor. <laughs> and the, they asked him how he felt about losing. But uh, Job and uh, Solomon, and when he wrote Ecclesiastes, the, written by Solomon, it's called the name means a preacher. They were writing from the, their reality at that time. And when Job makes a statement like, man doesn't even have the hope of a tree, as far as I could tell, Job says, when he's dead, he stays in that ground until the heavens and the earth pass. 
And from Job's perspective, he thought that was it. But he himself says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the end of the days, in my flesh, this is a testimony of the resurrection. So the answers were there. But during that process, you might not even see them. You might not even understand them. The faith of the church, I'll try to close this because it was unprepared. It's about 30 minutes. The faith of the church is we believe in the resurrected, ascended, living Christ. And we have the word of God. And some Christians over time, a lot of, there was a lot of criticism in universities because when we refer to some of this as the higher criticism, which is a particular mode of, you know, trying to critique scripture and all. And it primarily it covered in the past, rose out of the German university in the 1800s. But there was some men, some controversial men, but uh, Paul Tillich and different ones that some real conservative scholars hate those guys. Uh, you know, I don't hate any of them. There were certain things that were being done, but a lot of Christians did like lose their faith during a period of time where they were not familiar with, oh, well, wait a minute, you're saying this it wasn't here in this, and, and some of the higher criticism got so, if we say liberal in the field of theology, that it was like a rejection of everything. So we don't hold to that. If there are differences in the gospel, I write it up to this. Some of the accounts are a little different. It's no major challenge to any doctrine. The testimony that is given to us, we trust in the word of God, we believe in the word of God. And most of all, we are not like the scribes. Who, the, your head can be so that if there's some type of perceived flaw, oh, none of it is good. No, no, we have this living faith, this wonderful living tradition as well as this church. And we have the wonderful word of God that is true, that even Job in his desperation says something true. Even Christ, when he makes a statement, until heaven and earth pass, this law will not pass until it's all fulfilled. And many read that statement saying, see, he said none of it. No, he fulfilled it. And in the new covenant, we're no longer under the law. Not an excuse to kill and, and murder and do all that. No, we're no longer under it because it is fulfilled. All those fulfillments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and might, love your neighbor and stuff. Let me end because I hey, brush this. All the different uh, wonderful people now that you're interacting with. And I, I appreciate our African friends. Uh, we just have now a fourth African site. I think there's four in Africa. Just from Africa itself. There's others, uh, Australia. I just got one. But I like that because it's world outreach to me. And I see good things and bad things. And I just post my stuff. But I like it because I've mentioned it before, and I don't want to be self-serving. But for many years, I support one of the girls in Africa, a girl named Catherine. You know, send her $35 a month for many, many years. And I made sure that I wanted to keep doing that. And over the years, if, like, your card gets lost or whatever, you got to reset up your automatic payments, I always make sure that goes up. I don't want to neglect that. And I remember a few years back, somebody asked me. They knew I was having all types of financial and physical and everything else. And I remember they asked me, just, hey, do you still help that little girl in Africa, John? They're thinking, oh, John, after many of his problems. And I said, oh, yes, I make sure I do that. And then I realized later they were just testing to see. But I mentioned that to say, so I like being able to pray for the continent of Africa. And one of the sites, which is nice, and there's about four we got now. It was so cute because, you know, they can't maybe change the pictures of their face on the site that were uploaded. And and it, I don't know if it was a girl or a boy, but it seemed like a young girl and a young boy. And, and she just wrote, I'm new here. Keep following me. And then maybe the other boy or girl wrote, okay, I will. And I liked it because they're just learning on some of them are, you know, they know social media, but a lot of 
these younger people in these wonderful countries, they're just learning it. And so it wasn't something to make fun of it. You know, the English was a little off. It was just nice to see that. And as I saw that, I thought, these wonderful kids, wherever they're at, what an opportunity. And many of my friends, their African friends, are wonderful preaching and teaching and, you know, what God's using them mightily. But we as God's community, God's people, we have hope in the Word of God. We believe in the Word of God. And the Word of God is true. And even at times when the writers were writing things that would seem, they still spoke truth. They were writing things that they thought at times they didn't know. And they were still speaking the truth. That That's another testimony of Scripture, okay? Besides all the prophecies. And so today, uh, that one thing was what stuck with me. I would encourage all of us to continue <laughs> to have faith in the fulfillment. You know, that's we are all heading, if you will, uh, towards the fulfillment of all the things that God has for you, for me, for our lives. And so we, we uh, I, I, the scripture that I just posted this Sunday on the top of that post, which the Sunday sermon was, uh, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I think it was Psalms 27. <laughs> I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. And Job, you know, when he made that statement, he was at that place of, you know, fainting, if you will. But he knew that his Redeemer lived. And at the end of the day, he was going to stand and he was going to be raised. As I look at uh, some of these pictures around me from New Jersey, New York, and all these places, and friends who have died now, I have one here. It's so interesting. I just looked at it, you know, before, but the other day. It'd be hard to show you, but as I was walking up there for all those years, there's this old Jewish cemetery right where I grew up, and it's in a town called Fairview, New Jersey. Look, I have a lot of friends It's still in that area. So one day I said, oh, let me walk through that cemetery, besides the one where my sister was buried, called Fairview Cemetery. And on one of those walks, it, there's a, the Jewish people are, well, can't do it all now, but they have a tradition of putting the stones, stones on top of the gravestone. And it's a particular tradition. It comes from uh, certain scriptures. So as you walk through a Jewish cemetery, you will see these stones, not in a, a way that's like graffiti or anything, just sitting on top of the other headstones. So I put one, if you can see, I put one on the top, let's see, because I hate to turn it around. I put one on the top. Oh, I don't know how to do this. If you look right there, I put a stone on the top of that. Okay, great stone. Just, I thought, they don't, that's just the saying, North Bergen uh, Cemetery Mount, let's see, Temple Beth Abraham, North Bergen, New Jersey. I said, I'll put one on top of there, because that's not a person's site. Now, whether they left it there or not, I don't know. But it's interesting, I was looking at it one day, and I said, you know, that's a testimony in a sense. How long do things last? And scripture has these types of stones that were remembrance stones. And that's where they get some of that tradition from. The thing that lasts, the stone that the builders rejected, has become the head of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. The chief cornerstone. Upon, and Peter, when he confessed Christ, and that's one of the differences, by the way, in the Gospel of John from the Synoptics, is the great confession. But it's still the same confession. Okay. But he said... <laughs> Jesus would say to Peter when he would confess Christ, you're the son of the blessed, you're the Messiah. Blessed are you, son of Bojan, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And this is the stone. This is the foundation. This is the testimony. And if there's some perceived difference in the transcribing of the translation, 
of a book that speaks of the Logos, the living word, the living word himself, the spirit of God himself, gives testimony to the person that the book is speaking of. It's, it's a transcendent incarnation of the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as much as we reverence the word in the scripture, there's only one physical thing on the earth where God's spirit is actually residing in. And that's the church. That's the people of God. The word of God is anointed. The word of God speaks to us with to the spirit of God. But God is living inside the people of God, the church. This is the, we are the temple of God, all of us, the believers. And so I do find at times we need to be reminded that God is, God is inside of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, let me end with prayer. Hopefully you want to uh, glean something out of this. Uh, this is how, you know, I've done these all these years <laughs> with no intent on having to do. Really, I don't need to make any more of this. But I pray a blessing for them. Thank you for the well, friends. I pray you bless them today. I pray that insight, it only comes from God. So I pray that we would turn to God, that we would see <laughs> that the testimony would go forth in all the earth. I pray for you to strengthen the people of God. That, that, that we would be witnesses, uh, the great witnesses of the resurrection. Jesus said to us, Father, go in the whole world, preach the gospel to every creature. And so let that testimony that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for everybody. Let that word go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Better learn how to shut this.